I uh, made a major scheduling error by going after Will and Nada because I forgot how entertaining they were. <laughs> Explaining that how when you have a problem understanding a paper, you just need to take out core logic. <laughs> and then you have two problems. <laughs> So, uh, uh, you know, they asked me, when do you want to have your keynote um, this year? And I said, I don't want to have a keynote. I never get to have any fun. I have to do these keynotes. I have to try to think of something profound sounding to say. And it's just, it's a lot of work. And it's incredibly stressful and everything else. So instead, I decided to pursue this little hobby project that I had no time to work on um, using this device that didn't come out until November 1st. And um, a whole bunch of software I had never tried. Uh, so, the first question really is, uh, what is Harmonicate? And there was a good chance that by today, Harmonicate would have been a bunch of random bits that may have eventually become Harmonicate. But I got lucky and had a ton of uh, plane time and, uh, and actually made something that makes, makes something. So what Harmonicate is, is an additive synthesizer uh, for closure, written in closure, uh, using Super Collider via Overtone and core async. Uh, so no dating program, sorry. <laughs> uh, it's work in progress, uh, but it is open source and it's on GitHub right now if I push the right shiny button. Um, but don't go look at that. Look at this and you can look at that later. So what is, uh, what is additive synthesis? Basically, it's making sounds by adding together sine waves. Uh, and in, in particular, making complex sounds and, and uh, uh, sounds that have uh, pitch via, via that method. Uh, but you can use additive, syn additive synthesis for other purposes. In particular, you can use Fourier analysis to produce time and frequency split um, you know, uh, data about sound and then use additive synthesis as a way of resynthesizing. Um, that is not what harmonica is about at all. So, that's not an aspiration of harmonica, and that's not what it's going to do. Um, instead, uh, in the history of synthesis, additive synthesis was one of the earliest um, techniques for, for models, for doing synthesis via modeling. And it's an, it's an interesting model for harmonic instruments. So a harmonic instrument is something like a guitar, or a wind instrument, or a trumpet, or a piano, or something like that, that produces tones that generally have a bunch of partials at the harmonic intervals, which would be whole number multiples of the fundamental. So it's a fundamental note, then one, two times that is an octave up, that's the next harmonic. Uh, three times the fundamental is an octave and a fifth, four times is two octaves, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it ends up that you can reproduce any harmonic sound uh, by using only harmonic partials. And so additive synthesis that's trying to emulate harmonic sounds does it uh, via that technique. You also need some other things in order to have it be realistic. But the goal of, of harmonic is to make something that produces naturalistic sounds, but not necessarily emulative sounds, because we have a lot of ways to emulate sounds, including that resynthesis technique, um, the spectral synthesis now. There's also straight sampling, right? You want to reproduce a, an oboe, just record a whole bunch of oboe notes and play them back. Uh, but we want to make something that, that's uh, evocative of that. So it, it ends up that this is an old technique, this is an old technique, um, and, and it used to be uh, something that maybe you could do offline or, or whatnot, but it was computationally intractable to do in real time. That is definitely not a problem anymore. We can do this easily with, with computers today. Uh, the, the other problem, though, with additive synthesis traditionally has been uh, that there's just a ton of parameters, right? To, to reproduce a, a harmonic sound with any kind of fidelity requires dozens, if not a hundred or more um, harmonics. You know, that many, that many uh, sine waves. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to have sine waves that vary at least in amplitude over time, if not in pitch. So there's a whole bunch of settings you would make. You know, typically if you were to do a Fourier analysis, you'd say this sine wave has this envelope, and this other sine wave has that envelope, and another one has that. And so all those envelopes and all their breakpoints times all those harmonics uh, would be all the parameters. And this is just something that's unwieldy. I, mean, I want to make a sound that sounds like this, and you're like, okay. Go to you know harmonic 17 and set breakpoint 42 to a little bit lower, and it sounds like a trumpet. It's that's hard. Uh, so it's it's traditionally been a very difficult problem. There are a couple of commercial 
uh, additive synthesizers right now that take on this problem in different ways. One is alchemy, and alchemy is fundamentally in the resynthesis camp. They do a very good job of resynthesis. They produce arbitrarily complex envelopes with breakpoints. They do breakpoint reduction, which allows you to look at any one harmonic and say, don't show me 46 breakpoints, show me the six most important ones. But the breakpoints from one harmonic to another don't co-align. So every harmonic is its own story, and it's still a ton of parameters. So mostly there, what you would do is do some generic transform in the time domain, and then, uh, then resynthesize it. And you can do some kinds of transformations that way, but not, not most of them. And then uh, Razor, Native Instruments Razor, is another one that sort of says, well, you know, additive synthesis is really cool, but the only thing people really understand is subtractive synthesis, which is a technique whereby you start with the sound with a lot of harmonics and use filters to reduce it. And they basically give you controls that are like that, that just basically reduce or boost high harmonics with the same style of control that is tractable, um, that, that, um, that um, subtractive synthesis does. So uh, what we're trying to do here is do something that's new in that area, which is to have a human tractable parameter set and therefore a control set, both for what, like trying to establish the initial sound, the patch, and while you're performing, having parameters that you can manipulate that perform um, useful modifications of the sound. Yet, I would like it to be amenable to uh, analytic generation later. That is to say, to take those same kinds of Fourier techniques, perform an analysis, but instead of creating an arbitrary set of envelopes for an arbitrary set of harmonics, to yield parameters for this model, because this model is tractable for humans to manipulate later, that would be a magic recipe. I have not implemented all of that, um, but that's the idea. So we're trying for expressiveness and performance. Um, in particular, I wanna work, be able to work with devices that allow you to convey energy, right? We've seen maybe some demos of Overtone using Monome and some of these other controllers that are like switches. You know, no matter how, you know, you can, you can move your body around all you want, but it's on or off. It's not doing anything different. Um, but there are a ton of controllers like, uh, like this bad boy, that uh, are incredibly expressive. They record how hard you hit, you can wiggle them after the fact, you can squeeze them. Um, so those are the kinds of controls that virtuosic performers need to be expressive. So that's what we're trying to do is uh, route that control to the model. Other things I wanted to explore in doing this were to look at core async for control. Right now in Overtone, there are very traditional kind of eventy models for receiving OSC communication and MIDI communication. And they have the same kinds of problems that all eventing models have, the kinds of problems Core Async was meant to address. So one of the other experiments of this project was to go and say, could we help out uh, Overtone by starting to use Core Async there and, and demonstrating how to route uh, MIDI and other controller data with Core Async, for which it's a fantastic fit. And the last thing I wanted to try was to uh, do something with one of these. I've never actually owned an iPad. I just bought this iPad Air whenever it came out on the first. Uh, but the, the vision was the, all these controls that you, know, you need physical manipulation capability. So we'll use a touch screen to do that. And there are a couple of techniques for doing that and pieces of software to help that. So that's what, uh, that's what we did. So to give you some background on the pieces, the thing that actually makes the sound is this fantastic engine called Super Collider. It's what's underneath Overtone. Um, and it's a client server platform where the server basically manipulates a graph of, of generators. So you can imagine as a real-time graph of operators, like plus and times and, and logarithmic operations, um, whose, whose operands are streams of numbers at different rates. Some are at audio rate, so if you're listening to samples, the audio rate would be like 44,100 samples per second, and others are at control rate, which would be you know, 1 50th of that. Um, so that's SC Synth, that's the engine that does the hard work, actually it sends the output to the, uh, to the sound generation capability of the computer. And the other part of Super Collider is SC Lang, which is this object-oriented language for building and manipulating these graphs. Um, the way SC Lang talks to uh, SC Server is via uh, a new protocol or newish protocol called Open Sound Control or OSC. And it's, it's an extremely simple protocol and I really like it. Basically you have a host and a port and then a path, which is arbitrary, you know, this slash that slash that, and then some arguments, which would be numbers, usually floating point numbers and things like that, some basic scalars. There's some other things to it, 
there's some timing things you can do. You can say, I'm sending you this message, but don't process it for five seconds. And uh, some ability to bundle things. But it's, that's basically it. It's extraordinarily simple. And it is not RPC. It's one way. You just say, blah, blah. And you can, say, you can do two things with that. You can say, I'm informing you of things. You can use OSC for that. Or you could say, I'm trying to transform you. I can send messages to try to make you do something different. If you've seen the latest version of Pedestal, this terminology will be familiar. Uh, it was, I mean, it has the word sound in it. It really has nothing to do with sound. But the people who invented it imagined it as a successor to MIDI, which is the spec that goes back to the 80s for having synthesizers talk to each other. And it's both a, a protocol of how, what the data is as well as an electrical protocol for what happens over the wires, because it's a wired protocol. And we've had some ability to route MIDI over USB and eventually over wireless, but this is much nicer and much more generic thing, and you can use it for anything, and it has been used far outside of the scope of, uh, of sound. Um, and then we have Overtone which, as we know, is an awesome closure library that Sam Aaron worked on with other people. And it does a whole lot of stuff, uh, most of which, personally, is not really the, the way I think about making music. It, it supports a whole other way of making music. Uh, you know me and Emacs, I, I, don't, I can't use it very well. So like, I think you know, Emacs is one of the last things you want to have around when you're making music. Uh, <laughs> You, know, you need Emacs for making music like you need it for having sex. <laughs> and and for, the, for the uber geeks in the audience, just to be specific, that is not at all. <laughs> and uh, all the spouses out there can thank me later. Uh, but for, for the purposes of harmonic it, um, Overtone is the primary interface to SuperCollider. One, one of the many things the guys did in Overtone was build an engine uh, for talking to SuperCollider that replaces the SC Lang. It basically says you don't need SC Lang, you can use Clojure instead. And it really does make an extension to Clojure that allows Clojure to be a first class language for defining these algorithmic UGen graphs and sending them over to the SuperCollider engine uh, for rendering. Um, in addition, there's a, a also library support in Overtone for talking with this OSC protocol, which, which I used as well. So uh, some great Overtone, great stuff in Overtone. That's the part that's used by Harmonica. Uh, digging in a little, first of all, how many people have ever heard of additive synthesis or have any idea how synthesizers work? So most of you don't. Okay. Uh, so the approach used here to try to solve this problem of tractability. Uh, is to have a master envelope. And an envelope just says, you know, it starts here, it goes up, it goes down, it goes down, it goes down, it goes down. So it's, it's levels and rates over time. And an envelope describes, you know, a shape, a single line over time with a very few parameters. You'll say the rate to attack, you know, is N, and that takes this much time. The attack level may be fixed. There'll be some decay, time, a sustain level, a fade time, and a release time. That describes the, the overall um, shape, usually applied to amplitude. And the idea then is to have this sine bank, which is going to have 100 different sine waves, 100 harmonics, that express their envelopes and their gains in, as deltas on this master, which means that you get a single small set of controls, the master envelope, that can shape the entire thing, and you can you can customize that a little bit for the harmonics, but it's not necessary to set every breakpoint of every harmonic. And that's sort of the, uh, the secret sauce of this model for keeping it tractable. So you have uh, the ability to scale amplitude and, and frequency, uh, to scale all the parameters of the envelope via amplitude. That means things can get uh, louder or softer or take longer or, or less time, depending on how loud the sound is and or depending on what frequency is being played. And that's typical of natural instruments. For instance, the envelope of high-pitched sounds is often a lot shorter than the one of lower-pitched sounds. Or things may get brighter when you hit them harder or play them harder than not. Uh, it also has a low-frequency uh, oscillator. That's, that's an oscillator that doesn't run at audio rates. It runs at, runs at rates you know, 20 cycles per second or less that you use to modulate some of these other parameters to give you effects like um, vibrato. Vibrato is the kind of thing a cello will get or, or a wind instrument will get. And you can hear it. It's like a little beating to it. It's actually a slight fluctuation in both the amplitude and the pitch. Um, so you use that for that. It also has a frequency envelope. 
Stringed instruments and other kinds of instruments frequently will not immediately start at pitch, even with a very good player. Um, you know, you pluck a string and it's sharp for a little moment of time and then flat and it comes back up. Um, modeling those kinds of details is very important for making something that sounds natural. Um, in addition, it has resonance. This is a property of the instruments themselves. So any instrument that has a body to it will have certain frequencies which, with which the body sympathetically resonates. So violin body or guitar body or the actual shape, you know, the body of a clarinet will have certain frequencies with which it's resonant. And it ends up that our hearing is more sensitive to resonance than almost anything else. Right? When I talk in a single tone of voice and I'm making all these different vowel sounds, I'm not actually changing the pitch that I'm producing. I, I mean, I did just say pitch, but the rest of what I'm saying is, is actually pretty even, but you can tell the difference between all the vowels. And the reason why you can, and the reason why you can recognize your mother's voice is because as you move your mouth and move your tongue around and change the shape of your mouth by speaking, you're actually moving around the formants of your head and your, your vocal cavity. And it's that that we're most sensitive to. So modeling resonances in instruments is an extremely important part of making sounds that are realistic. Uh, the final piece, which I have not actually gotten around to implementing, is noise. So most instruments are not super pure like that. Um, if you play a flute, there's a little chiff to it when you start. If you pluck a string on an instrument, there's a thick sound that's done there. A bow will chiff um, on a string. All these things can be um, modeled via noise that's added to the harmonic stuff. Um, so it says I have a diagram. Let me, whoa, and I'm sideways. There we go. I'm just about as good at using this as any other computer. Uh, so this is the this is like the the model of the model inside. Fundamentally, any sound is going to start with the specification of amplitude and frequency. You're going to say, "I would like to play this note this loud," and that's the input to the model. The LFO may modify that, adding again in a in a domain that makes sense. So we're saying adding decibels to volume or adding um, sense to a representation of the pitch in octaves. Uh, so a logarithmic thing that allows addition and subtraction. Then it'll go through the master envelope, which is going to shape the amplitude. It has those parameters delaying. So you might want to wait a little bit. because Some sounds don't start till after the noise. So there's a little noise and then, then the harmonic sounds. So you might want to delay the entire envelope. Attack is the amount of time it takes to get to its loudest point. Decay moves it down to its sustain level. Fade is the, the ring that would happen if you held the note. And release is how long the note takes to go away when you let go or stop blowing. Um, so those are the normal parameters. And for the master envelope, there's, they're expressed absolutely. right? And then you have the sine wave bank. There's 100 harmonics, 24 of which give you these delta manipulation over these same parameters. That number 24 came from, that's how many faders I can fit on the screen on a touch screen, a move without you like accidentally hitting more than one. So there's some like UI feedback to the design of the model. Um, and then, and then there's similarly there's that frequency envelope which gets you know, modulated as I described and that feeds the frequency. So the first um, harmonic is one times the frequency, the second is two and three and four and five and it really is just whole number multiples. Again, like I said, this isn't for arbitrary noise effects, although I'm pretty good at making noises and not very good at making anything else so far. Uh, but it, I, I'm, I don't anticipate allowing you to set arbitrary pitches for the harmonics. It's going to remain harmonic. The one thing we might do is um, stringed instruments, for instance, at certain tensions will have harmonics that are sharp. So modeling something like that is in, in the spirit of harmonic it, but arbitrary pitches for the harmonics is not. Uh, and then we get out of the sine wave bank and we add them all together. And that plus sign over there, that's where the term additive synthesis comes from. Take all the sine waves, add them together. Then we feed that summation through the resonances. And the resonances are filters. You can imagine them. They're just like the body of wood in the, in the violin. And you put whatever pitch you've got through it. And if it's not a resonant pitch, the body of the violin says, mm, it's boring. And if it is a resonant pitch, it says, whoa, baby. You know, and it starts, it starts wiggling around and amplifying that, amplifying that. So there's four tunable resonances that will allow you to model that aspect of, of an instrument. 
And then we have the noise thing, again, like I said, it's not implemented, but that will get added. So then you reintroduce the resonance, add it to all the harmonics and the noise, and you send it out. Voila, that's Synthesis 101. Okay, demo. Before I start the demo, I'd just like to say that doing this was a blast. Um, it took me back to my memories of a, a much younger me. And the very first piece of commercial software I wrote was that thing, which as you could see was uh, noted for having faders and knobs. And this was actually a new thing back in 1987 uh, when I first did it after having taught myself C and 68,000 assembly language. So uh, it's fun. Oh, I have another diagram. Look at that. See, this is, touch screens are great. They're, they're like computers, but they're harder to use. <laughs> you ever notice everyone's like, they touch their screen like it might explode. Uh, so I have a pile of stuff here, which I can't necessarily pick up without unplugging. But I wanted to just explain sort of the high-level physical nature of what you're going to be seeing here. Um, we'll start inside the process. So inside, of, I've started. Hopefully my computer has not gone to sleep. And, oh, yeah, look at that. Let's make sure. I hope it kept its network going. <laughs> uh, so uh, in the computer, we have a single process, and uh, Harmonicit is, is the program that's running. It's a closure process. It's loaded overtone. Um, Super Collider server can run either in process or out of process. Um, in the case I'm showing you right now, it's running in process, mostly because that's what I got to work. Theoretically, everything I've done should run with it out of process, but that might be something for us to fill around with during the, uh, the unsession later. So what happens is, uh, Harmonica has, a, has the model. If you supply it a frequency and a pitch, it will make a sound. Let's make sure that still works. And we'll test our sound. Everybody hold your ears in case it's too loud. It's not loud at all. <laughs> Do we have sound? Uh, could it be a little louder? All right. That's harmonica playing. And that's playing it um, in the overtone way, which means you type something into Emacs and say go. It's a lot like playing the violin, except for being completely different. <laughs> uh, I, actually, I don't want to make fun. I mean, it's totally fine to use overtone the way it was intended. Um, and, and in fact, there's nothing wrong with this either. Overtone does all of these things, and I'm just using a slice, a slice of what it does. Um, so we can drive Harmonica directly from Emacs. It talks to Overtone. Overtone says OSC messages to Super Collider server. Even if it's co-located, it still pretends to do the same job. Uh, and Super Collider sends stuff out. And then I have two control things. One is this QNexus, which is a little MIDI device. It's, it's actually wired. Um, but uh, it's talking to a driver that turns its MIDI into OSC. So I'm only listening to OSC inside. That's called cheating. Uh, because I didn't get time to do a MIDI interface, which would let it talk to anything MIDI. I mean, there's a sense in which OSC is supposed to be the future, but it's not supported by a lot of devices. By the way, this is the coolest thing ever. Look how thin this is. It supports MIDI, OSC, and control voltage. You can play like synthesizers from the 70s with this thing. <laughs> it's really amazing. Uh, and Lemur, which is a piece of software for the iPad, which I'll show you in a second. And um, Lemur is talking to the computer via OSC over uh, UDP, wirelessly. And the wires are only to drive the monitor and keep it powered up. OK. Oh, actual demo. <laughs> that would be good. So this is Harmonica. Oh, look, you can almost see that. OK. So let's see if this is still talking. No. Yes. OK. 
So we talked, we talked, so I sent a patch from the computer into uh, Lemur. So Lemur essentially, it has no sound production capability or anything else, it's just a bunch of controls that know what number they're set at, and if you touch them, they send numbers back. Uh, but we can quickly get a tour of the architecture here. So uh, right in the middle is the main, the main deal. Let's see, make sure this is still talking. Well, let's make sure this is still talking. Make sure anything is still talking. Uh, good, okay. So um, this should change the volume. Great, okay. So this is the master envelope in the middle here. Uh, pardon my fingerprints. Uh, so we have gain, we have delay, which is, which is what's keeping it from happening it right away. Uh, we have attack, so we can make it slow. So for string sounds, you'd want to be take more time, and for plinky sounds. So that's that, we can turn that on and off. There's also uh, an LFO, if I turn this back to something more sustained. So we hear the that's, that's the LFO pretending to be vibrato. And I can make this extreme, this depth extreme just to make it noticeable. And to demonstrate the frequency scaling, so there's some frequency scaling set there. That says, as you go up higher, it should be faster, so if I go up, couple of octaves, see that's faster, right, and lower, and lower still, Ooh. so that's that, and you can use that to model um, vibrato, and you can turn that on and off, so that's without any vibrato, it's very unnatural to have that. Um, up top, in the center, we have the deltas. So that's all the harmonics, well that's actually the first 24 harmonics. Um, and you can turn them on and off individually. You'll see every other harmonic is turned off. That's typical of a clarinet. Clarinet doesn't have all those other harmonics. So we can turn them all on. And get something that will seem a lot brighter. And buzzier. Well, that's too bright. Turn down the higher harmonics, you can boost a couple to get like a nasally kind of. Turn on some of the lows. I can't play and do this at the same time. And when I'm not doing this, I also can't play. <laughs> this is not my instrument, this is just. Uh... So we can, we can adjust the gain of the harmonics. Um, and we can also have deltas for all the other things. So we can have amplitude sensitivity for the harmonics. We can have, ooh, that's why that wasn't working. So we can have frequency uh, sensitivity for the harmonics. We can adjust the delay, so let's try this. I'll turn this down. Anybody hear the high frequencies coming later? That's pretty gross, but. <laughs> But there are good reasons to do that. We don't have any right now. <laughs> we can also uh, make, make the high harmonics come in later. The, there's some tuning I need to do of these parameters in terms of the ranges. I, I literally made this work on the train yesterday on the way here. Uh, but if this was more sensitive, pretty slowly. But that's, that's the path to brass sounds. But the high frequencies will come in later. I can't actually fabricate a brass sound. And similarly, you can have the decay vary, the sustain vary, and the fade and the release per harmonic of the first 24 harmonics and turn them off and on and all of that stuff. 
Um, we also have this frequency envelope I talked about. I think it's set to a pretty extreme setting at the moment. It ends up in, in practice, your, your, so the initial frequency is where it starts relative to where it's supposed to be. So I can make that more subtle. And then where it goes to. And we can tighten up the timing. At this point, You can hardly hear it, but in the context of a piece, in the context of playing a lot of different notes, those very, very subtle things are the things that will make it sound like music as opposed to a, a machine. Um, so there's all of that. And then we have the resonance, which has been on this whole time, but I can turn it off. So it's pretty, there's not much body to this, right? So I'll turn on the first resonant point and uh, turn the gain way up and sweep it so you can hear what resonance does. If I could use a touch screen. So that's starting to feel like a woody place. So I'll turn the gain down on that. I'll turn the other one on and do the same thing. I'll we'll set the width tight and put it up. You can hear that sort of sound like, ah. So there are certain points you can set these formants where it starts to sound voice-like because there are formants we associate with, oh, that's a person's voice. That's a, you know, these two, there are two in particular that the setting of these two formants will, you know, this is E, this is ah, this is O, oh, this is ah. Uh. Um, one of the things I'd like to do is have more feedback to the device about the actual specific frequency here. So if you looked up the formants for an instrument and said, oh, I need 200 hertz, you could find it as opposed to, you know, wiggling around. It's, it's much more musical. I can turn this back off again. That's the path to, again, more interesting things. And you have four of those to play with and just a lot of control. I think, I think that's sort of all the parameters. Uh, so the idea is this is relatively tractable. This is all on one screen. Uh, you know, obviously, you're, you're toggling between these, but they're all doing the same thing. It's eight times the same, eight times the same job. And that's, that's essentially the inside of, uh, of Harmonica, the engine. And uh, I'm here. So that's a demo. There's a lot left to do. This is brand new stuff. Um, one of the things that is not the case right now is the code is not really even a library. One of the things about Overtone is it's extremely oriented towards live performance. So there is a, a lot of use, like use, 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 use. Use is everywhere. And not only is there a lot of using, but there's a lot of using and then like sucking the names into a different namespace. So not only is everything used, but if you take a name and like type it in and press enter and say, oh, I'll figure out what the namespace is, it's not the real namespace. So it actually is quite difficult to figure out where all these functions are. You can see examples of use and be like, that's the function I want to use. But trying to figure out where in the namespaces it, it lies is tricky. So uh, I'd love to go through and just do that so this is a real library where everything is properly namespaced because we're not looking for that interactive, you know, I only want to type, you know, one thing so that I can play music on the, key, on the computer. Uh, we just want to make a library. As I said before, some of these parameter ranges could be fine-tuned so that the, the sweet spot of the range is, it maps to the controller correctly. Um, there is no noise generator. There is a design for it. Um, but it needs, I mean, the space on the screen for it too, but there's no UI or engine for that. Um, currently, it's, it's mono timbral. So one of, the, one of the cool things about this is, you know, Overtone is great, and you can write your own synthesizers. Um, a synthesizer like this is a big job. This, I can attest that this is the biggest synthesizer that has ever been made in Overtone because Overtone was incapable of compiling it or sending it to Super Collider without patching. Um, and, and uh, I sent uh, Sam the, the patch for the compiling part. I'll send him the, the shoveling the, the uh, graph over part. Um, 
But it's a lot of work. And, you know, I've talked before about, you know, the levels. You know, if you want to make music, I, I, don't, I don't want to even go back to making the synthesizer again. And a lot of synthesizer algorithms, especially the small ones that you'll see, there'll be a little bit of code and it makes like a, something that sounds a little bit like a violin. And if you want something else, you have to write another kind of synth to make something that sounds like a clarinet. Um, additive synthesis is really general. So the effort we put into this additive synthesizer is one that will benefit everyone because you really make a lot of different kinds of sounds. Um, and to the extent you can, then it would be nice, for instance, to be able to play more than one sound with the same engine at the same time. Um, if I have time, I can talk a little bit more about the overtone part of this, but it seems like, well, how many people use overtone or, or hack overtone or play overtone? Right, so maybe the, maybe the um, uh, after hour session is a better place for sort of the details of how that works, because there were some interesting things about how this gets implemented in overtone. Um, so I want to do that. We want to make it a first-class synth. Right now, there's just some code that I'm triggering, uh, but you'd want something that's more um, enduring you know, to send the messages to and monitor and load samples into and drive via channels. Um, right now, there's a bunch of code that's sort of mm, more specific to this lemur software and this device than I'd like, but that's easy to do. And finally, if you just want to be a consumer of this, you don't want to work on the code at all, but you're a musician and you want to play with it. I mean, making patches is just you know, wiggling these things around so it sounds like what you want to hear. And then saving that, it makes for a nice little 40-line bit of Eden. And that's what patches are for this synth. So I'm happy to have patches. Right now, there's no patches. This is one really bad clarinet-ish patch. Um, so I'm happy to have people participate just that way. That would be fantastic. Uh, I'm going to talk now about um, three of the bigger picture, the bigger picture ideas. So obviously, I did not have much free time even to make this in the first place, and I'm not going to have more free time moving forward. So it would be great to get help, or uh, these are just ideas I think would be cool. The idea is to support analytic generation. I think that this model can become the target of analysis. So what you do is you do, well, there's specific kinds of transforms specific kinds of Fourier transforms that are really amenable to resynthesis. But we'd use one of those. What it does is it, it will produce a set of arbitrary amplitude envelopes for a set of harmonic partials, as well as a noise residual. Given those two things, you now have like a curve fitting problem, right? I only have this, these breakpoints, right? This, the model is delay, attack, decay, sustain, fade, release. Every harmonic has to get that shape. The first thing you need to do is detect the overall master envelope so that all the deltas are small, and then fit the individual curves, which are arbitrary, to a set of parameters that most closely fits them. In which case, you're going to get something that's not nearly as realistic as the full analysis resynthesis stuff. I mean, you can take those sounds, put them through that process round trip, and not detect the difference with the source, unless you really have great ears. Uh, that's not the point here. The point here is to get something that's naturalistic and a starting point for saying, well, I took a clarinet in and did this job. Specifically, the way to do it, or a way to do it, is to take four samples, right, a low note at both a low and high amplitude, and a high note at both a low and high amplitude. Because we have all that frequency and amplitude scaling, you can end up with an envelope and settings for amplitude and frequency scaling that will allow you to fit it. I'm saying it because it's easy to do it like this. It's harder to do it with the program. But I do believe it's possible to fit to a parameter set. And then the point is to get something that's um, driven by this natural, uh, this natural inspiration, even if it doesn't sound exactly like it. But then you have all these controls, which are, I think, quite tractable to, to shape it to be what you like, which is what you're missing from the other, the other ways to approach this. Um, another thing I think is particularly interesting about this especially given the fixed parameter set. Again, this is the kind of thing that's difficult if you have 100 arbitrary envelopes, but if you have 100 very specific envelopes, um, you can start uh, modeling um, higher level control things. Like on a lot of instruments, there's some notion of muting. Right? With, on a guitar, you rest your palm against the strings when you play, and you get a different sound. I mean, there's ways to mute a lot of different instruments. So, so having a notion of muting and getting a control for muting that was sort of a, a master control that manipulated a set of parameters is something that's quite possible. Because the you know, thing is, unlike Alchemy and, and uh, Razor, 
you have the source code of this thing. So this is something that we, we can do. Uh, overblowing and the kind of alternate harmonic sets you get from doing that on a, on a wind instrument are, are, are possible. And then the bow techniques, right? There's a whole bunch of different bow techniques. And again, we're not trying to make something that, is, um, that sounds like a cello. We want to make something that's expressive like a cello and kind of cello-ish in, in being musical like a cello is musical. But not, I mean, we could, we could learn to play a cello if we wanted to do that. Um, another, another area which some of the commercial synthesizers are getting at, but is incredibly difficult to do well in the technology they deliver to end users, is, is something called uh, context-sensitive articulation. So when you're, when you're playing uh, an any kind of instrument, you have all kinds of options. I'll just talk about stringed instruments like violin or guitar. Um, if you're going to play two notes on the same string, one of the options you have is to articulate it twice. So let's say I'm going to play this note and then that note on the same string. So this is just higher on the fretboard on the same string. Uh, I can articulate this one and then articulate the next one or pluck this one and pluck that one. Or usually I can pluck the first one and just lay my finger down to make the transition. And on a guitar, that would be called a hammer-on, and on a violin, it would be called a... What? Okay. <laughs> Slur. Oh, look, it's right on my slide. Uh, so it, it becomes really difficult to do that when you're using these kinds of devices, right? Because really, you don't have like a slur button. And, and, and maybe you're trying to play with two hands and you've got to use your nose or foot or some other thing. Um, and, but it ends up that, that, that these things follow, follow rules and patterns. For instance, if you're playing really quickly, you're going to have a lot more slurring because you just can't, you know, you can't articulate everything. So you could algorithmically figure out at this rate, at the rate these notes are coming in, we're going to slur a lot and automatically transition to slur style articulation as opposed to um, uh, explicitly articul articulated stuff. And there are all kinds of things like this. You can build models, for instance, on, on stringed instruments. There's often more, more than one place to play a note. I can play the note on this string here, or that string there, or that string there. Uh, so you can have a model of, well, I mean, if your hand was here, and you need to play that note next, you're not going to go like that. You're going to play the version that's nearby, which means if you have a model of how the different strings sound, you can now move to the other string and get things that are more naturalistic that way. Um, so these are, these are, this is sort of like algorithmic context-sensitive rules that would control these higher-level parameters. Uh, some of the newest um, uh, sample playback engines will pick samples based around this kind of stuff, but they all have these scripting languages that is like, you know, you know about scripting languages, right? <laughs> so now you would have closure, so you could write, you know, arbitrary, uh, sophisticated things to do that that would perform well enough to happen in real time. So I think that's a very interesting area. Uh, I'd love for anybody who's interested in this to try it out. Um, it's on GitHub, you know, there. And there's an end session tonight uh, for people who want to dig into it. But uh, that's it. I think I have time for questions, if there are any. Yeah. Yes, widget is essentially a pair of things. Uh, uh, lemur, sorry. Lemur is a pair of things. It's an editor that runs on your computer. There's also a way to edit in person on the, on the pad. I didn't try that. And essentially, yeah, you drag and drop controls on a surface. And then for each control, you say, what kind of message should it generate, uh, which is the path. Again, it's this OSC stuff, the path and then the range of values. And so yeah, you drag and drop the stuff and move it around and pick all your colors. And of course, that took three times as much time as everything else. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's quite good. The other alternative is uh, Touch OSC. It doesn't seem to be as active to me. It's, a lot, it's cheaper. But Lemur is, is $50, and it's, it's well worth uh, paying for it. The guys are doing a great job. So. Um, and uh, Lemur is scriptable. I didn't use any scripting for this, uh, but I thought I might need to, so I didn't want to be stuck. It also supports these tabs in place, which uh, Touch OSC does not. So I, I like it. Um, but I haven't figured out a bunch of things like 
had to send a string to replace patch name with the actual patch name and things like that uh, yet. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's not, it doesn't do that at all. It doesn't have any audio rate input at all. Okay. Yes. It is not available for Android, but Touch OSC is. So one of the possible growth areas for this is just to write a touch, touch OSC interface, right? That's just the edge of the system. The model works the same. Um, currently, the thing that receives OSC messages is specific to Lemur, but that's just a, a, a core async map function away from mapping Lemur to something generic, and then we could target the same generic thing from Touch OSC, which does run on Android. Um, so, uh, and yeah, you can, you can make your own interface for this, make alternative interfaces. I'm not in love with this touch screen, so I have this beautiful uh, livid code controller with actual real knobs and, uh, and push buttons and stuff, and the next thing I'll probably do is, is set that up to, to drive this, because that's um, a little more tactile. And for some reason, I just, uh, touch screens don't like me. Uh, yes? They're not harmonic, that's correct. This is the wrong synth for that. <laughs> right, so that, ex exactly, that, that's, that's part of the, the mission for this. This is for harmonic, har harmonic sounds. Because the problem is when you start being able to do anything like that, you lose the tractability. You know, if people had to tune these har harmonics, you know, wow. It, it's very difficult. Um, so, uh, but there aren't a lot of categories of sounds, so you could make a synth for just for inharmonic uh, or, or not purely harmonic sounds and do bells and, and ringy things and cymbals and things like that. Uh, and then you'd cover a whole, whole additional area. People have done some interesting drum modeling, which is another thing that's not um, harmonic in the same way. Uh, so I would see them as complementary. I, I wouldn't try to make one thing that made every sound. So it ends up making none of the sounds really well. Yeah. Uh, so for async, uh, yeah. good things, bad things, surprises, patterns you find yourself falling into? Uh, it ends up that the amount of core async in this right now is very small, um, but, I, but already I think the benefits are quite evident. Um, when you compare it to the, the code that's in Overtone for handling OSC and MIDI, I mean, immediately they run into the, I have multiple callback handlers and they need to coordinate kind of problem and all that goes away. Also, we have, you know, nice ways to do mappings and routing and multiplexing and merging. So uh, I think it's just a gigantic win for control in this kind of environment. And uh, nothing about using it surprised me at all. Which should not surprise you at all. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean the idea is to come with a, up with a model that acts as a target. I mean, if you saw my talk about um, design, composition, and performance, you know, one of the problems you have is. If, if every day the orchestra comes in with like different instruments, you know, you just can't write music. And so making, I, I think this plus noise is, is a, is a well-known um, set of parameters. I mean, you have resonance modeling, you have low frequency oscillation, you have frequency envelopes, you have a full harmonic spectrum. And you, what I anticipate is having two noise generators, one for the initial noise and another for any sustained noise. So for instance, there's often an onset noise, and then something like a, a flute will have an ongoing uh, breath noise, or a, or a bowed instrument will have an ongoing um, bow noise. So you have two noise generators. Um, no, the idea is to keep it simple, and like, because when you do that, then you force all, you know, again, constraint drives creativity. You force all the energy into patch creation. And patches are things that everybody that's running the same synth can use all the patches that everybody made. So, yeah, it's sort of like the same answer for, you know, reader macros. 
And it's Chris, it's, it's, it's actually, it's the same, it's the same problem, right? If everybody's working in a different language and you can't share, you can't share the patches or the programs. Other questions? Yeah. Moving between presets? Yeah, so once it's multi timbral then a possible target is what patch to use. So you could load in a set of patches and via remote control switch between patches. And, and the, other, the other growth area, which I didn't mention there, is there are lots more, a lot more controls available on this. And uh, usually in synthesis, you end up with something that's called matrix modulation, which basically says these are all the modulatable things, these are all the modulation sources, and you can arbitrarily route any one to any other. And I think Corey's thing is going to be a great tool to use to make a matrix modulation thing, which I think would be very powerful. Then you encounter a new device that has a whammy bar or an XY control or a, um, a ribbon controller on it. There are breath controllers. There are a lot of really cool controllers. It's definitely my intention that this support dynamic control well, and that the, these parameters would be targetable by that. Other questions? No, no, it does two notes at a time right now. Except when my computer is asleep. <laughs> or they turn the volume down. One or the other. Come on, baby. Too loud. It's saying it's too loud. There we go. Plays more than one note now. So multi timbre is more than one sound, timbre, more than one sound at a time. Uh, so you could load up a cello sound and a violin sound and a viola sound and make a little trio. Uh, that would be the idea. Yeah. And so I'm curious what beyond breath controllers, like what have you thought about for alternative interfaces to to play an instrument like this? Oh, but that's not for me. I mean, that, that's a that, there are a gazillion things that already generate uh, modulation. There are pedals. There are there are you know electric violins. There are breath controllers that have all the keys of a of a wind instrument and in the same uh, order. There are ribbon controllers, there are XY pads, there are joysticks. Yeah, there's, there's MIDI everything. So um, that's just, you know, so I wouldn't invent anything there. I would just say, you know, pick your controller and we'll map it. Yeah. I am. I can't do anything with this. Yeah, I, I know I have a mini guitar I can play this, sure. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah, you know, they, most of those things map to standard. I'll show you a little bit of code because we have five minutes. Uh, most of those things map to uh, standard MIDI um, controller numbers. So even though it's a guitar, it's still mapping the, the whammy bar or the amount of pitch, amount of string bend to standard controls like pitch bend and modulation wheel, which are you basically say, I will respond to modulation wheel on the six different controllers with very different shapes that generate modulation wheel um, output. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's nothing, there's nothing new in any of this, really, except probably the model design, um, the parameters of the model. The model is well known. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's the, that's the generative modeling thing I was talking about before. I do think that's possible. But I, what I won't let you do is produce a harmonic that's uh, a partial that's not harmonic. That's not a whole number multiple. Um, so I just wanted to show you how cool uh, Overtone is. These are, these are the async loops that, like, this handles the patch editing, 
This one handles the notes from the keyboard. Um, really, that's all there is. It's, this is, it's so tiny. That the whole thing is 200 lines. But this is the big, ooh, it doesn't quite fit. Can people see if I make this smaller? All right, close enough. This is, this is the, the main part of harmonica. Uh, and, and what's cool about uh, overtone is that you're writing things that look like functions, like function calls that are happening now. But what's actually happening is when you call harmonica, these functions get run, they decide, are these ordinary numbers, I'll do the math right now, are these numbers that who are, whose sources are control rate signals or audio rate single, signals. If it's one of those, the result of the times or the log uh, call is actually a UGen um, uh, specification that's going to go and, and turn into this graph. Uh, but you can see what's nice is an instrument is parameterized by the buffer that's going to get the parameters from the note number, which is a MIDI thing, and the amplitude from zero to one, and a gate which basically says, I've let go of the key, so therefore you should start that release phase. Um, and then you can see that we take the frequency and we, we uh, turn it into uh, cycles per second, and we can do some, the LFO manipulation on that, which is just a call to LFO. Um, I, I'll, I won't go through these, but the similarly you calculate the gain and whatever, you make an envelope out of all those things, you take the signal and you generate 24 harmonics with full specification and the rest of the 100 um, follow the last one at the moment. And we add together that, that signal, that's the sum of all the harmonics, plus the four resonators at the moment. We'll add the noise right here. So it's that tractable to look at this. And then the parts are also quite tractable. I'll look at a resonance and LFO because they both fit on the same screen. Uh, so LFO says, you know, take the frequency, scale it out um, from, from 1 to 20 uh, uh, decibels in the, in the amplitude range and uh, not at all in the frequency range. And you create an envelope for that. It's just going to go from 0 to 1. That's the ramp up. The LFO has a ramp up, like how fast it comes in. So sometimes, usually your vibrato doesn't kick in right away. It sort of swells up. So there's a ramp for that. That's that envelope. Um, and then that produces a number that's, that's going to go from 0 to 1 as a sine wave that's going to get multiplied, that's going to get multiplied against the amplitude and frequency of the master to have them follow along. So that's the uh, sine os right there is the actual source of a new signal. And the kr says that's a control rate. So we don't need to, we don't need to do that any faster than, you know, uh, a, a, a thousand times a second or something like that. And the resonance is the same kind of thing. Uh, we're going to call this primitive called resins, which is a, a resonance modeling primitive in Super Collider that takes the frequency, the center frequency of the resonance, and then how wide is it. So vocal resonances are really small. Sometimes instrument resonances are kind of, kind of wide. So that gives you a taste of this, but if you want to see more, uh, come to the end session. Thanks.